Would you like to know how I first met Randy? Yes. Raise both hands. And if there aren't enough, the balcony gets sneaky. So raise both hands. I met him on the floor in Lakeland, Florida, <laughs> when there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I think we were all on the floor. Isn't God good? I'm a fanatic. How about you? I'm a fanatic about him. Look at someone next to you. Say, honey, you look like one. <laughs> I want you to open your Bibles or your phone. Or if you didn't bring a Bible, smile at someone who did. And they will share. And I want you to open your Bible to Genesis 37. Now, to me, this is a very special opportunity because you have a hunger to really serve God. And you're here in great passion to go out and reach people. Am I right? Yes. And that is so important. And I thought this morning as I saw some of you and looked around how wonderful this is because there's nothing like ministry. And what I want to share with you today will help you with God's divine appointment for you. You know, none of us are an accident. We're all a divine appointment. So look at someone and say, honey, you look like a divine appointment. <laughs> now, this is what I want to share with you. God has a vision for every one of us. God has a destiny for every one of us. And when I look at the life of Joseph and I look at my own life, I see how it is a process. Everybody say process. And I remember living in Texas when I was six years old and lying on the ground and looking up at an airplane and thinking, someday I'll be on one. Now I practically live on them. But, you know, you don't know what God is doing. And then I lived in Sewickley, Pennsylvania. I was born again in Jamonville, but it was in Sewickley in seventh grade. I took Latin and I loved it. Ended up taking five years of it. Then I took Spanish, I took French, I took Greek, and I felt I was called to be a foreign ambassador. Now, called, that was just my attitude. And uh, so I prepared in every way to be a foreign ambassador. I thought I'll teach someplace, then eventually, you know, I'll get into a diplomacy school and all of that. But all of that was part of the process. And when you read Psalm 139, you will see that everyone here, God has a divine appointment. And that he even keeps a book on you, how he makes you. So if you're skinny, he put in the book, skinny. If you're fat, he said, fat, fat, fat. No, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> so, but all of us are divinely destined and God has a plan. Now, what I have found, I'm going to give you four points so it'll be easy to remember. The first thing is he begins to give you dreams and you begin to see these things in your mind some way. So I want to look at Joseph. You know, Joseph, very young, the youngest, well, next to Benjamin, and he had two dreams. And he was a young man when he had them, and the sun, moon, and stars bowed down to him, and then the sheaves of wheat bowed down to him. And he told his dreams to his brothers. Now, you know, God puts things in us, puts special dreams, but our family doesn't always understand. You know what I'm saying? You know, you may say, well, I have a dream someday of being a medical doctor. Or I have a dream of going to Monaco or, you know, Morocco or someplace. I have a dream. But a lot of times your relatives just think you're crazy, right? And so this is the number one key thing I want you to get. You have to hold on to your dreams. That's number one. You can't let them go. So put your hand on your heart. Say, I will never forget the dreams God gives me, I have to hold on to. And so I look at Joseph. He had these two dreams, and it looks like he is in authority. 
And then I began to see something else that's very, very important. And the second part of this, the four parts, is that you have to practice. Everybody say practice. So there's a young man in our church, and I dearly love him, but he came to me about six years ago, and he said, I had a dream that I had a meeting as big as Reinhard Bonnke. And he said, that's going to happen. I said, well, he said, what would you suggest? I said that you go across the street and win your neighbors. <laughs> because dreams have process. Everybody say, dreams, dreams. have process. process. So I see what... Joseph began to do. He took over his father's estate. And he had, he had an ability to organize. And so you start that. And when I began to see the lost people, my husband and I started a church. And I thought, we don't have any lost coming. And I said to God, where are the lost? He said, if you want the lost, you have to go get them. And so I learned you had to do that. But all of that was part of the process. Everybody say process. Well, how do you get the lost? So I began to have Bible studies with women. And over a cup of coffee, a cookie, and a Bible, they'd get saved. And then I started at night to have some dinners with their husbands. And their husbands over, you know, dinner and Bible would get born again. And so these people said to me, have you ever thought of going to, on the radio? Now, this is part of the process. Everybody say process. And now you will say, well, you hadn't been to Bible school. You're right. As a school teacher. I did take Greek, but, you know, I'm not very good with it. Sarah's really good with Greek and Hebrew. I'm not. And so, you know, I was in a process because these people would come and get saved. They began to get spirit-filled. They began to come up to our church. And then they said to me, we could get more people if you would go on the radio. Radio? Well, you know, how could I afford it? So I went to my husband, and my husband said, I'm fine if you go on the radio, but it's your baby. You feed it. <laughs> he said, why can't those Bible studies pay for it? Well, I said, it's $60 a month. He said, honey, you got to have faith. So I went to the Bible studies, and they put me on. And so I had five minutes every weekday, and that was very wonderful. But we began to have a lot of response. Now, what's going on? I'm practicing. Everybody say practicing. And I taught Sunday school in our church. I start, taught these Bible studies, and I was pra practicing. Now, let me tell you, when you're practicing, not everybody is encouraging. And I remember, and my husband was very encouraged. He was wonderful about it. He just wouldn't pay for it. But <laughs> I remember an evangelist that we liked so well that was from Wales came to our church and he said, you know, of all the pastor's wives I know, you're the least prosperous and the least successful. I said, why? He said, well, you don't play the piano or organ. I said, that would really be unsuccessful. <laughs> he said, you don't have the women's missionary thing. You don't roll bandages and make quilts. All you do are their silly little home Bible studies. And so I want to tell you, when you're in the practice, not everybody is going to be encouraging. Are you hearing me? And so especially your relatives. <laughs> so I lived in Sewickley, Pennsylvania, and I had a wonderful aunt. And so when my husband and I started a church, she was very embarrassed. She wouldn't even tell her, her friends that I was in the ministry. She, They'd say, well, Marilyn, what are you doing? Oh, she, they just do a little church thing, that's all. You know, and she said to me, you could have made something with your life, but you've just thrown it away. No, I just caught it, <laughs> you know. And so your relatives don't always understand, but you don't give up, right? Look at someone and say, honey, you don't know how to give up. <laughs> okay, so here he is. He's taking care of the estate, and he's a very good organizer, and he's doing very, very well. But his brothers became very jealous. As I said, many times our relatives do not understand. And so the father really recognized him and recognized he had ability, and he gave him a many-colored coat, which showed that he has authority. 
So, you know, he's next to the youngest, and they didn't want him having authority over them. And they knew about those dreams. So one day, they were out working in the fields, and the father said to Joseph, I want you to go and tell the brothers, you know, uh, that what they are supposed to do. And he gave Joseph this many-colored coat to show that he was in authority. Now watch, when he started out there toward them, they said, ugh, here comes the dreamer. This is family. Everybody say family. Because <laughs> many times family do not understand why you would set aside a career or set aside money and just really devote yourself to Jesus. And so they said, oh, here comes the dreamer. And they were so jealous of him and so unspiritual that they threw him in a pit and they sold him as a slave to Egypt. Now, this is what I have found. God uses all kinds of circumstances to train you and practice you for what he has for you. I know this about God. He's very economical. He doesn't waste anything, nothing. And so, you know, here he is. He's been practicing on his father's estate, and he gets sold by his brothers. And by the way, they grabbed the coat, you know, and they put blood on it and lied to the father and said an animal had killed him. And so he gets to Egypt. Now, watch yourself, because while you're practicing, you could get bitter at some of the comments, and you could get unhappy with some of the things people say, right? And so he could have said, dear God, where are you? You know, here I am up here in Egypt. I'm a slave. My father probably thinks I'm dead. And, you know, forget it. Hang it up. But he didn't. He practiced. Everybody say practice. And so in this timing of God talking to me, I thought, you know, I'd like to go on television because I think if I had a Sunday morning program, because Oral Roberts had one and one of our pastors did, you know, this could be a good thing for our church. It could help it grow. We could win more lost. So I went to Channel 9 Secular Studio to see if they would put me on. And so they had me meet with their board, and there were nine men. And these nine men looked at me, and they said, you're not television material. You would never make it. You better stay with the radio. Now, folks, I've only been on television 45 years. And none of those men are on television. Hey, God thinks you can do anything. Hold on to your dreams. Everybody say, hold on. Don't let go. So one man stood up and he said, I think we ought to try her. I think she'll pay her bill. And so I did for eight years. But in this timing, the radio was beginning to grow. And we syndicated the radio. And the radio was really a blessing to me. But, and I loved radio, and I loved what the people that it reaches and the response of it. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of money or a lot of anything. And if you knew where I did my radio tapes, I did them in a closet in the basement of our house. And, you know, one time a cricket was down there. And right in the middle of the tape, the cricket went chirp. And I had to start over. And then it chirped again. And so finally I just gave up and thought, put a chirp on. <laughs> and a woman, I think from back east, said to me, I'm in a mental hospital. I hadn't heard a cricket for many years. And the chirp really encouraged me. So these are things in the process. Everybody say process. So what did Joseph do? He practiced. Now remember, every new situation you get into that you practice in is developing you because God doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste anything. And so he's practicing on that estate, and he's very good. He could really motivate people. He really knew how to organize people. And so Potiphar is quite impressed with him, but so is Potiphar's wife. And she tries to seduce him. And later I'll tell you about his words, because your words in this time are very important what you speak. So he told her, no, 
you know, I don't want to hurt your husband. I don't want to let God down. And he fled from her, and she grabbed his coat. This guy loses more coats. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you may lose a lot of things along the way, but there will come a day when God will restore it beyond anything you can imagine. So she grabs his coat, tells her husband, he tried to rape me. So this is awful. You know, first it's my brothers. I lost the coat. My father thinks I'm dead. And now it's Potiphar. He thinks I raped his wife. And now I'm in prison. So he's in prison. And if you read this in Genesis, it's very interesting what he does in prison. He organizes. He organized the prison. Isn't this something? And while he's organizing it, they said, you know, this man has real talent and ability. He didn't whine and have a pity party. How many of you ever had a pity party? Did you notice they don't work well? You need to have faith parties. And you need to speak what God says about you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm surrounded with favor like a shield. Thanks be unto God who always causes me to triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Every morning I get up and this is exactly what I do. I make coffee. I say, oh yeah. I say, good morning, Father. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. This is your beloved Marilyn. You say, well, how arrogant is that? In your Bible, my Bible, 63 times in the New Testament, he calls me beloved. So what are you? Now look at someone and say, honey, I know this about you. You're his beloved. Amen. So in these negative situations, keep saying what God says. And he didn't get bitter. And so two men have dreams and they come to him and he interprets their dreams. Now see, I could have gotten really bitter at this point. Dear Lord, why are you sending these people to me to interpret their dreams? You know, I can't even get my own to come to pass. No, I'm not going to interpret their dreams. But folks, until you sow in another's dream, you will never reap your own. And I thought this morning, you were sowing in the dream here. Do you realize that's very important for your own dream and your own calling? So I'm going to share something with you. Are, oh, Pastor, they're not ready. Oh, do they have it? Okay. So I'm going to share something with you. Uh, my husband and I started our church, and we heard Daisy and Teal Osborne. Daisy and T.L. Osborne, maybe you've never heard of them, but they were world evangelists. You know, they had meetings all over, and we went to one of their meetings. We just have a little church. We had saved $1,000 for a car, and so we went to that meeting, and they were raising money for their building in Tulsa, and my husband said, I feel led to give the 1000 Well, I didn't, but he just did it anyway, and so we got home. I tried to be real cool. Don't don't say anything, don't have a fight. But I wakened in the night and I thought, we don't have a decent car and he's giving away the money and I'm awake worrying and he's sleeping. So I said, wake up and worry. <laughs> and I'm the great woman of faith. <laughs> and so he said, now Marilyn, God told me to do that. And he said, God will provide a car. Now listen, sewing is very important. Everybody say, sowing is very important. Because if you don't sow, you don't reap. So we don't have a car except an old raggedy thing that we're trying to make work for us. And then sometimes we had to borrow a car to get to church. And John Osteen, you know who Joel Osteen is? This is his father. He came to speak in Denver at Full Gospel Businessmen. So they said, would you like to have him speak at your church? And we thought, yeah. So he gets there, and he says, I see the letter C-A-R over your head, Pastor Hickey. Do you need a car? And my, cousin says, my husband said, well, kind of, kind of. We're so desperate as pitiful. 
And he received an offering for a car. Now, that's not the end of it. Sowing, everybody say sowing, brings reaping. Now we're in the process. Everybody say the process. So then I was on radio in Tulsa, and I was invited to speak in some churches, and so I went. And I wanted to meet the Osbournes. You know, I was so touched by their ministry. And, you know, they had a school. They had all these things. So I asked if I could take them to lunch. So we went into a restaurant, and Daisy met me. And she said, God has called you to go to kings and leaders of nations, and you will be a world evangelist. I thought, Daisy and crazy rhyme. <laughs> you know, I have children at home. But I was in the process. Now, the unique thing about her saying that to me, and they didn't, they didn't know me. The unique thing about that, that was within six weeks, I was sitting in the living room of Mrs. Anwar Sadat, whose husband was killed. He was the president of Egypt, praying with her at her invitation. You see, folks, God is cooking. Everybody say, God is cooking, but you have to stay in the process, right? And you have to sow. And I sowed, but I never dreamed, I never dreamed how I would reap. So then, you know, Joseph interprets those dreams and one man died, the other man was restored to the Pharaoh. And God is so interesting, he gives the Pharaoh two dreams. And I said this to the Lord, you know, you give a lot of those Old Testament people dreams like Nebuchadnezzar and like the Pharaoh. He said, well, they won't listen to me in the daytime. <laughs> so he gave him dreams. And Pharaoh has two dreams. He doesn't know what they mean. So he tells his wise men, they don't know. And one of the men that Joseph has interpreted his dream takes care of his wine and his uh, drinking and he said, oh, I know a man who interprets dreams. He's in prison. And said he interpreted two dreams and mine was absolutely true. So the Pharaoh's quite desperate. So he calls for Joseph. And Joseph didn't get bitter. He went up and interpreted some more dreams. He could have said, well, good night. I can't even get my dreams to come to pass. Now I did those in prison. Now I'm doing his. Ugh. But he gave the interpretation. What is he doing? He's sowing. Everybody say sowing. Everybody say process. Look at someone say, honey, you're in the process. Don't give up. Keep sowing. So they send for Joseph. And Joseph tells him the dreams and what to do with them. Seven years of plenty. Seven years of famine, gather up the food. And so he says to Joseph, I need an administrator. And who's been practicing? <laughs> Joseph had been practicing. And see, sometimes women will come to me and they'll say, I want to travel with you and sing. I say, well, do you sing in your church? No. Do you take voice lessons? No. Do you solo any place? No. Well, the answer is no. <laughs> no practice, right? Practice is really important. And so he tells them there will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And here's something very interesting. The Pharaoh gives him a new coat. See, there'll come a day when the devil has to restore what he stole, only it'll be better than what you had before. <laughs> the way God works is so wonderful. So... Seven years of plenty, they gather up the food. Seven years of famine, you know, they kind of parcel it out. But something is happening to Joseph's family because the famine has hit where they are too. So the father, Jacob, he thinks Joseph is dead. He sends some of his boys down to buy some grain. And when they come to the border of Egypt, and remember, Joseph is the administrator, and he recognizes them. And I don't know, 
if when you read that part of, Gen- of Genesis, he's always crying. That really touches me. You know, they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And he kind of fools with them and does some things, asked about the father, you know, asked about Benjamin. And so they go back to the father, take the grain, and then they run out again, and they have to go back, and they have a brother there that's in prison, that Joseph has kept him in prison. And they come back to get more grain, and there's quite a few things he does in between. I won't go into all that. But Joseph sees them and invites them for dinner, and puts them seated in order of their age, and they don't quite know what to do with it. And Joseph begins to weep and tells them, I am your brother. And they think, oh my goodness, he wants to kill us. And he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And he saved his family. Because what did he do? He held on to his dreams. Those dreams were family dreams. She was bowing down to him. He was going to feed them, right? Sun, moon, and stars, his father is going to move down there. And they were going to live in Egypt and be under him. Those were true dreams. But he didn't get mad and get bitter. And bitterness is an ugly, ugly thing. And, you know, being a pastor's wife for 57 years, I think that's the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, when you're on radio or television or you're going and holding meetings in other countries, you know, you don't have people abuse you much. But in church, you can pour your guts into somebody and they walk off like, how do I spell your name? You'd like to slap them sideways. (laughs) And then in church, you have to always be ready with something fresh to feed them. Don't preach the same sermon you preached last year. And all of that was practice. Everybody say, practice. It was all good for me. So then, when I was 45, I was very involved with radio, but I wanted to get more into television. And so I went to TBN, and the Crouches were very good to me. They gave me three programs I would do every week, and they paid for them. So... I began to see people writing in and calling in and people who were getting healed, people who were getting saved. You know, I thought, man, television is really a good way to go. So I went to Paul Crouch and I said, "Uh, I would like a daily program. Oh, he said, that's a lot of money. And I said, well, could you just give it to me? (laughs) Well, if you never try, how do you know? So he said, I can do it for one year, and then you have to pay for it. And so I went on daily television with TBN. Of course, now we're on Daystar and God Network and some other networks, Word Network. But you reach people that are shocking. And God really convicted me that we didn't have enough altar calls on our program. And of all things, he convicted it with Schindler's List. Remember that movie? Well, I watched it one night, and he said, oh, if I'd sold my car, I could have saved one more. If I'd sold this pen, I could save one more. And God said to me, you could save one more if you do altar call. So I told Sarah, we're never going to have a program from here on without an altar call. Just one more. And this is what I say every morning also. I love sinners, and sinners love me. And so I practice on airplanes. They can't get up. (laughs) You know, I have certain restaurants. And with the restaurants that are near us, I have a wonderful reputation because I go in, I compliment their food, and then I say, you know, I like to pray. Uh, Would you write down two prayer requests? I'll take them home and pray over them. So the other day I went in with a friend, and this waiter, there was nobody in there, comes rushing up, and he said, I want to speak in tongues. I know you do. I want you to. <laughs> Folks, God loves sinners. God loves people out there who are hungry. They're hungry. And if we'll be loving with them and not religious with them, we don't have to compromise. I don't compromise my stand but I let them know I care about them. And folks, love works. Love works. Love doesn't fail. 
So Joseph forgave his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. How good could it be? Look, the whole family moved down there and lived there and were safe, didn't die. And what would that family do? They would produce the Messiah. Folks, you never know when you are faithful in your dreams what it's going to produce. If you had seen me early years, 40, 45, you would have probably said, forget it. You're not television material. You're not even radio material. You're not a good pastor's wife. But I kept practicing and practicing and practicing. Are you with me? Am I stepping on your toes? I'm trying. (laughs) Then at 45, and my husband has always wonderfully supported me, and at 45, I took some time and fasted and prayed and said, God, I've always felt I was in my husband's call, but have you called me? I'd like to hear from you. And he called me in that time of fasting and said, I've called you to cover the earth with the word. Well, how on earth would you do that? That was a big, big call. And this is what I want to say to you. God will give you a dream, but then he will give you the how-to, and then he will give you the networking. Everybody say dream, Dream. how-to, and networking. Now, what's the networking? It's people, right? Who know how to do it. So let me just tell you one wonderful incident. I went to Ethiopia. This, are you here from Ethiopia? Oh, I love your country. <laughs> I've been there nine times. So I went in 83, and they were under communism. You were under Russia at that time. And they were also under famine. And I read about it in the newspaper. I thought, oh, God, do you want me to do something here? So I went out and bought 10,000 Amharic Bibles, that's your language, and $10,000 worth of food. That's a big deal for me. And then I applied for a visa in D.C., you know, with the one who was in charge, the Ethiopian man, and I couldn't get him. So here I am, 10,000 Amharic Bibles, $10,000 worth of food. I'm to leave in two days, and I know people thought, she is crazy. And always there are going to be some people that think you're crazy. And I said, some of my staff said to me, well, what are we going to do? You have two days. I said, it'll come. I'll leave, you know. And so there was an Ethiopian woman in our church. And so I said, Ruth, I'm trying to get this man, you know, in D.C., and I, I can't pronounce his name. Would you mind calling and seeing if you could help me? She said, okay. So she called him. She talks to him in Amharic. She laughs. She talks. She hangs up. She said, you'll have your visa tomorrow. I said, how did you get it? She said, he's my old boyfriend. (laughs) You don't know who God's going to network with you. That's called networking. (laughs) So that was the beginning. Now I have been in 134 countries. And we're going to China and Mongolia in May. You can go with us. It's not too late. I've never been in Mongolia. That'll be a new country for me. But my favorite countries are Muslim countries. And I'm going to show you a video. When I began in the ministry, I would go to Christ for the Nations. And Frida Lindsay prayed over every nation every day. And she mentored me. And she was very hard on me. She said, if you do this, you won't have a ministry. Stop saying that. Your mail is wrong. I thought, is anything right? But she prayed for every nation in the world every day. And I said, how long does it take you? How do you do it? She said, I memorize them by continent. So I did it too. And when I would pray for the Muslim nations, I would have a great passion for them. I thought, who? Who's reaching them? Who's reaching them with Jesus? And so in 1989, I went to Pakistan, to Lahore, Pakistan, and had a healing meeting. 
They'd never had one, and certainly they hadn't had a woman. And everybody said, you know, they hate women. Then this is what I started doing. I love Muslims, and Muslims love me. I said it all the time to our staff. I love Muslims, and Muslims love me. So when I got there, we had 4,000 people. And we had people saved, and people delivered from demons, and people healed. And so it put a passion in me to reach Muslim countries. Am I sharing this with you? Because everyone here is in a process. You've got to hold on. Everybody say, hold on. Even when people are negative to you, hold on. Because you know what makes you supernatural? You know what makes me supernatural? I'll soon be 87. People say, I can't believe you do all the things. But what keeps me supernatural is the vision. God called me to cover the earth with the word. I'll soon be 87. I'm doing more in my 80s than I did in my 40s. Don't tell me what God can't do. Hold on to your dream that makes you supernatural. Amen. 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 Hold on. Never let go. Don't let people discourage you. Stay in the Word. Stay in the Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. You can be seated. So we hold on. And we practice. Everybody say practice. practice. <laughs> I have a young man I've been mentoring. When I met him, he said, you know, I'm going to have a meeting, and I'm going to have it as big as Reinhard Bonnke. You know, and I think I told you, go across the street and win your neighbors first. And this is some years ago. But now he has been invited to have a meeting in Myanmar. And 80 pastors are going to be there. And I said, honey, God is cooking for you. Because in all this time, he has practiced. Everybody say practice. How long have I known him? Probably 12 years. But he's been practicing, winning people, working hard, supporting ministries. Everybody say practice. Being faithful in church. I mean, willing to do anything. And if you will practice and consider everything a part of what God has for you. And then sowing. Sewing is so important. I wonder if today I would be doing what I'm doing if we had not sewn in Daisy and Teal Osborne's ministry. And I got a book of theirs, an old book. It's called The Gospel of Daisy and Teal, and it shows the 60 countries they went to, and they're the same 60 I've gone to. I'm telling you, we have a very supernatural life. Amen. But there's a fourth thing I didn't tell you. Do you want number four? Yes. We'll come back tomorrow night. <laughs> no, no, you want to know it now? <laughs> Raise both hands. You have to forgive. Yes. You know, along the way, you're going to have disappointments. People are going to let you down. People are going to misunderstand. You know... If I had those brothers that Joseph had, I'd have slapped them a few times. <laughs> Wait a minute. Before I feed you dinner, I'm going to slap you sideways. How could you do that to me? But he forgave them. And he lived the lifestyle of forgiveness. And because he forgave them, he saved the family that would produce the Messiah. You don't know how far things are going to go from your life. And you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have people think you're nuts. And you're going to do crazy things and people will correct you. Right? And you need it. Right? But you have to forgive. I think he forgave his brothers. I don't think it. I know it. I think he forgave Potiphar's wife. I think he forgave the prison for what they probably did and he endured. I think he forgave the Pharaoh, but most of all, he forgave his family. And in forgiving, he saved them. Folks, you don't know what's on the other side of a problem, do you? So I'm going to tell you one other thing, then we're going to pray over your dreams. Now, I want to see if you're really listening, because see, I used to be a school teacher. 
Number one, what do you do? Hold on. What makes you supernatural? Your dreams and visions. Okay. What's the second thing? That means I do anything they ask me to do, right? Oh, well, I'm too spiritual to do that. No, 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 no. We're a servant. Everybody say, I'm a servant. Okay, so we serve. We practice. What's the third thing? You sow in the dreams of others. Isn't that key? We sowed in a lot of different ministries, dreams especially. You know, the Osbournes. Little did we ever dream that I would reap that ministry. I didn't dream that. So we sow. Everybody say sow. sow. But what's the fourth one? Forgive. Forgive. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk to you about what you say about your life and what you say about others. So, you know, people will say to me, well, you know, you're a woman. Women can't do anything. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> and you're going to hear things. Well, you'll never amount to anything. Say back, I'll amount to everything. I'm God's beloved. Did you know in the New Testament, you are called beloved 63 times? You must really be loved. That's a lot. And so when people say things to you, you can't do it. Put it on the back burner, but keep practicing. Everybody say practicing. Practice. Keep practicing. Everybody say practicing. Practice. And keep praying. Everybody say keep praying. Keep praying. So every day... I speak certain promises. I speak about 40 of them with coffee. Amen. Got to have coffee in the morning. And then, of course, I pray for my family. But I pray for nations, especially Muslim nations. And so for a lot of years, I prayed over Iran. Now, Iran is kind of a different kind of Islam. And so I felt like God wanted me to go in there and have a meeting. And so when I tried to get a visa, they said, uh, I said, I'm a tourist. They said, you're not a tourist. <laughs> we know who you are. You're an evangelist. No way. But, you know, the game is not over till you win. Yeah. Say the game yeah. is not over, not over. Until, I until I win. And so I kept trying. And I'm in Brazil, and this man who's in Brazil, I'm speaking at a church there, and he said, I have a travel agency in Iran. Would you ever want to go to Iran? <laughs> well, as the Pope a Catholic, I guess I would. <laughs> and he got me into Iran twice as a tourist. That's not what I want. I want to have a healing meeting. And so, you know, how's that going to happen? So... There's an imam, and you saw him on the video in Pakistan, and he knows the imam in Iran, and he's going to contact the imam in Iran to have me for a healing meeting. Yeah. What is this? This is networking. Everybody say networking. And you never know who it will be, do you? Or whose cousin will be something, or aunt, or uncle, or somebody He'll say, well, I want to help you with that. And so I believe I will have a meeting in Iran. I've only prayed for nine years over it. But I don't give up. So look at someone and say, honey, don't you give up. In due season, you shall reap if you don't faint. Now, I'm going to minister prophetically to you. And I kind of do it with scripture. Are you okay with that? Yes. So what I'll do is I'll do scripture for this group right here. Okay? So I want you to stand up. This scripture you know, Romans 8, 28. He makes all things work together for good to them that are the called of God, to them that love him. Right? Yes. So put both your hands up. Say bye-bye problems. Bye-bye problems. Bye -bye worries. Bye-bye fears and anxieties. Bye. Romans 8, 28, Romans 8. Operates, operates in my mouth, in my mouth. 
and in my life. In my life. Amen. Amen. I want this group right here. I'm not dividing this very well. I wasn't good in math. Okay. Now, the scripture I want to give you is Psalm 138.8. And this says that he puts all things in divine order in your life. And there are things that are out of sync. You know, I had a son that got into drugs, messed up big time, alcohol, that now is turned around. So you're going to triumph in it because God is going to work in it. And as for me and my, we will serve the Lord. So put your hands up. Say, Father, thank you for Psalm 138.8. You're putting things in divine order in my life. Amen. Okay, I want this group to stand up. John 15, upstairs too. John 15, 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Amen? Amen? So what should you ask? Big. 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 Okay, they got it up there. Now, this group up here, well, let's just take the rest of the balcony. Stand up. Second Corinthians 5, 4, 17 says, Thanks be unto God, who always leads us to triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Folks, you are wearing today winning perfume. <laughs> winning perfume. You need to talk like a winner. You need to act like a winner. And you will smell like a winner in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> now... I have books out there, Blessing the Next Generation. That has to do with the generation curse. We're not under a curse, right? We're under a blessing. Do you know how far the blessing goes? A thousand generations. That's cool. And in Step with the Spirit, this is Sarah's book. You will love it. She is so turned on to the Holy Spirit. But I think one of the best things God ever gave me was Know Your Ministry. It will help you to understand what your ministry is and everybody else's. Now, I want you to stand up again. We're going to pray over your dreams. So put up both your hands. Say, Father, you called me for such a time as this. You anointed and appointed me. I thank you that you're putting my life together. You're encouraging me. And I thank you. You're causing many things to work for me and not against me. I thank you, Father. This teaching is doing something big in me. It is bringing a turnaround in my faith. Now, I want you to turn around. Now, don't cheat. Turn all the way around. I don't know if the balcony did it. Did you do it up there? Okay, I want you to say this with me. Put your hand on your heart. Say, thank God. This conference is bringing a turnaround in my life. In my life. Amen. 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 <laughs> okay.